Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, ashhadu an Muhammadar Rasulullah, ashhadu an Muhammadar Rasulullah. Hayl salah, hayl salah, hayl salah, hayl salah. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, la ilaha illallah. Audhu Billahi min ash-shaytani rajeem. Bismillahi rahmani rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammadin abdiku rasulika nabilu miyyi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam taslima. Subhana rabbika rabbil azati ya ma yasifun wa salamun ala mursaleen wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa la hawla wa la quwata ila billah ila liyyik ila deem. We're coming into the last days of Ramadan, the final 10 days of Ramadan, and that's usually the period that most scholars believe uh, is the time of Laylatul Qadr, the night of power, the night of destiny, when the Quran was first revealed to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And the story of that is, of course, well known. He was in retreat, spiritual retreat in the cave on Mount Hira, and he saw this angel appear uh, on the horizon, and then he felt a weight sort of crushing his chest, and the command, Iqra, recite, which also can mean read. And he said, I can't read. And then he heard that command, Iqra, three times, and then on the last one it became, Iqra bismi rabbik alladhi khalaq, Read or recite in the name of your Lord, most generous, who created man from a blood clot. Uh, that command to read or to recite was the, the Quran kind of coming down all, all at once. Now this happened during a period, again, of spiritual retreat. And we all need spiritual retreat at times. The practice of itikaf, uh, withdrawing into the masajid during uh, the last days of Ramadan is encouraged. Uh, it's also people sometimes do the 40 days of spiritual retreat and that's all well and good. And in fact, many people in Western culture kind of can identify with that, with the individual spiritual aspiration. But I'm going to suggest that there's actually more to spirituality than just that. And that that actually could provide a clue as to how we can cure mass formation psychosis. Because that's the title of the chutbah today, is the cure for mass formation psychosis. So what is mass formation psychosis? Well, Matthias Desmet is a famous Belgian psychologist who has studied this. And of course, the term, the real academic term actually is just mass formation. The word psychosis has been sort of tacked on by people who think that the world has gone completely mad in the COVID era and now in the uh, Ukraine war era. Mass formation is, is the kind of thing that has been studied in the past in terms of the madness of crowds, the psychology of totalitarianism. And it's a problem when, that, you know, it's, it's this, this totalitarian psychology, mass spreading contagious totalitarian psychology happens, according to Matthias Desmet, when these four conditions are met. The first condition is when many people are alone and feel isolated. The second is that their lives feel pointless and meaningless. The third is that there are high levels of free-floating anxiety. And then the fourth is that there are also high levels of free-floating frustration and aggression. And when all of these things come together, the isolation, a sense of meaninglessness, anxiety, and frustration and aggression, then 
this mass formation or sort of totalitarian mass psychology breaks out and people go crazy. Uh, and of course, the COVID dissidents would say that that's kind of what happened when people all went crazy for, uh, let's say, masking and lockdowns and other kinds of COVID containment measures. Uh, some of them, of course, were, were obviously crazy, such as masking on an airplane where the air is completely filtered and where people have their masks off half the time anyway because they're eating and, and drinking. Uh, so anyway, the mass formation psychology has been you know, cited by people like Dr. Robert Malone and other uh, COVID dissidents. And the book by Matthias Desmond that just came out that I hope we will be discussing with him on my radio, radio show soon, inshallah, uh, it gets deep, more deeply into this. And it describes this historical trajectory by which Western societies have become extremely vulnerable to this mass formation, call it psychosis, call it mass psychosis if you want. Um, that's not what, what Desmond calls it. So why would we have this be a special problem in today's culture? Well, first think about loneliness and isolation. People are probably more lonely and isolated now than ever before. And of course the COVID scamdemic made that even worse. As people had to be locked up and hiding from everybody else. And if they ever came out and saw any other human being, they would hide their face to do it. So isolation, it's a common problem. In fact, it's been shown that Americans' health is being radically negatively affected by social isolation. There are all sorts of studies that show this, that one of the strongest predictors of health is how many you know, fr close friends and people you have in your community, people that you see regularly. So of course the COVID lockdowns prevented people from seeing other people regularly and contributed to this. There was a, a famous study of a town in Pennsylvania populated by these Italian immigrants who always hang out together and visit each other and have this really strong community. And they found that there were no heart attacks at all under like age 60, when that was a leading cause of death for people in their 40s and 50s among other groups. So loneliness and isolation is totally endemic to today's modern Western culture. So individualistic, right? The culture tells you that the only thing worth living for is individual achievement. And so everybody wants to climb the social ladder and the economic ladder and have luxuries and such. And this puts basically all of the rats in the maze are against all the other rats. It's a war of all against all, like Thomas Hobbes wrote about. Uh, and it's red in tooth and claw, emotionally at least. And so people uh, become very, very isolated, lonely. And of course, this adds to that fourth condition, the frustration and aggression, because people get frustrated because of course they never achieve their ultimate highest dreams or whatever. You know, whatever you want to be, there's always somebody who's better at it than you are unless your name is Giannis and what you're doing is basketball. Uh, I'm just throwing out my vote for the MVP. But uh, seriously though, people who are just competing for individual achievement and isolated from each other are gonna have these problems. They're gonna feel isolated and they're gonna feel frustrated and aggressive. You know, com competition is really all about aggression. Okay, so that's two of these conditions. And how about feeling pointless and meaningless? Life has no meaning, right? Well, that's precisely what this contemporary secular culture tells us. The materialistic secular culture just says that all of the cosmos is a big accident. And you know, there's that Monty Python routine about this, I think, that does it in a humorous vein. It's so there's no meaning to anything. It's all just totally random. Sheer randomness, you know, drove evolution of, of life. Sheer randomness created the planets and the stars and everything else. And so there's no uh, pattern and no meaning and no purpose. And so the culture actually teaches that. That's kind of the basis of the scientistic ideology. And so then finally, the fourth of these four conditions that have to be met for mass formation psychosis is the, uh, uh, oh, we already got that, the anxiety. We already got the, the, the anxiety is, I think, perhaps partly due to fear of death. There's a, another branch of psychology called the terror management theory that claims that people's levels of free-floating anxiety are proportionate to the extent to which they're thinking about death or trying to repress or forget about their own death. And so anything that reminds people somehow of their own impending death makes them 
anxious, gives them anxiety. And of course, the secular, modern, materialistic culture is perfect for fostering that kind of anxiety. Because not only does it say that there's no meaning, no purpose, everything's just an accident, but it also says that, hey, you know, when you die, you just rot, and that's it. Uh, or, you know, as a popular t-shirt version of this has it, life sucks and then you die. Well, that's quite a philosophy uh, to wear on your t-shirt. But it's also a philosophy that's going to give you all of these problems, free-floating anxiety, frustration, aggression, pointlessness, meaninglessness, loneliness, and isolation. Hey, uh, Western culture has come up with a perfect witch's brew to create mass formation or call it mass formation psychosis if you want. So what's the cure for this? Well, Matthias Desmet, I guess, is, uh, you know, he's from the psychoanalytic tradition and he's uh, kind of, a, he's still within the Western humanist paradigm. So he's, uh, I haven't finished his book yet, so I probably shouldn't uh, pronounce on what his uh, cure for this is, but I think there's a much more simple and straightforward cure than what he seems to be offering based on what I've read so far in his book. And I'll get to that cure for mass formation psychosis in the second chutbah. So, what's the cure for mass formation psychosis? Well, whatever it is, it would have to address the problem of loneliness and isolation. It would have to address the problem of pointlessness and meaninglessness. It would have to address the problem of free-floating anxiety. And it would have to address the pr problem of free-floating aggression and frustration. Well, what could possibly do that? My answer, in a nutshell, is, and this is the title of another chutbah I did a while back, spiritual solidarity. We could call it spiritual communitarianism, if you want, because what I'm talking about is the opposite of the idea that spirituality is always a totally personal individual quest, where you go off into the cave by yourself, you achieve whatever enlightenment you may achieve off by yourself, you're sitting cross-legged in the cave and ah, the light bulb goes on over your head, and you're sitting there cross-legged and, whoa, you're rising up in the air. Wow, you've achieved enlightenment. You're, uh, you're levitating. So this is kind of the, uh, the caricature of a certain kind of spiritual individualistic practice that we find among certain folks in India, uh, often from the Hindu tradition, where they go off and go into isolation for very long periods. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. And indeed, that's what Prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, did when he went into the cave on Mount Hira. And then he, achieved, he had that revelation come down. And that revelation became the Quran. But you know, that revelation, that's not just like an individual achieving enlightenment and floating up into the air. That's God revealing a whole nexus of discourses and practices that can help people live the kinds of lives that they're meant to live, reveals the purpose of life that provides a way to avoid anxiety, aggression, frustration, that avoids isolation and solves this problem. And for that to happen, this Quranic revelation that came, again came down on the night of power, Laylatul Qadr, which may be coming up this week. It's an odd-numbered night, it's believed, in the final 10 days of Ramadan. That this Quranic revelation was a revelation not just to one person, not just to the Prophet Muhammad, وسلم, not just to his family and companions, uh, and uh, radiallahu anhum, and not just to the people in that first community, and not just the people in the second community, not just the Ashaba and, and the Ansar, not just the early Muslims, but everybody. It's actually ultimately uh, a message to everyone, to the humans and the jinn, a message to all the worlds. And perhaps other messages like it in some ways have come down in all of the worlds, or some many of them. I don't know how many worlds. I don't, I, I don't have a 
calculator that goes that high. Uh, so this revelation, the Quranic revelation, is a revelation of spiritual solidarity. It says it's not just about one guy going into a cave and achieving enlightenment. It's about God's message to the human community to band together as a community based on spiritual solidarity. That's what the message really says. And that's why the early Muslims quickly formed a spiritual community. And of course they were persecuted. All of the truth speakers are persecuted. All of the prophets are persecuted. But that just reinforced the community as it had to band together even more intensely. And that community grew. It made the Hijra from Mecca to Medina. It fought a war of self-defense against those who wanted to kill the prophet and exterminate and end that community. It ended up taking over its enemies in Mecca in a nearly bloodless uh, not even a battle. And it spread. It spread through all sorts of means, ultimately through communication, of course, uh, but political power as well to some extent. And it spread around the world. And people have been forming communities based on this Quranic revelation ever since. And this message, again, it's one of spiritual solidarity. It's not a message saying, hey, if you have a spiritual vocation, maybe you can be a priest or a monk. You know, maybe you can go to church or go to your whatever your practice is on, on Sunday or on Saturday or one day a week and then just live a secular life the rest of the time and not worry about the spiritual stuff. That's for the professionals. That's for the Pope and, and the bishops. That's for the, uh, the, the Hindu uh, master or uh, the guru or whatever. No, it's for everybody equally. It's not like some people, you know, very few people have this great spiritual vocation, others don't. Well, sure, it's, I'm sure it's true that people have differing levels of capacities and gifts for spiritual things, just like for everything else, right? Not everybody is a basketball genius. Not everybody is a physics genius. Uh, people have wildly different talents in all sorts of different ways. However, spiritual aspiration is the purpose of life for everybody, period. No exceptions, none whatsoever. Once you realize that, and you realize that that has to be the basis of human community, then you, you see the genius of Islam, which, which does this. It creates that spiritual basis of community, and it has for its entire history. It's under assault today. This Western, ultra-individualistic, materialistic, scientistic, progressivist paradigm, this secular paradigm, is really being pushed by people with massive power and money. And these people with the massive power and money, these oligarchs, these people, are the people who have a gift for uh, competing with their fellow humans in, in wealth and social status and power. Unfortunately, the people with that gift are, for the most part, psychopaths. So we're living under a pathocracy. We're living under the rule of psychopaths. And naturally, these psychopaths want to promote the social system that works for them. So they promote liberalism, which means total freedom for billionaires and psychopaths to grab as much power as they want and do any darn thing they want. They promote atheism because that's what they think makes sense. Because, hey, you know, I'm self-made. I'm just doing this. There's no meaning. There's, I don't want God or anybody to be telling me not to be grabbing this wealth and power uh, and doing any darn thing that pleases me and, and grabbing pleasure through all sorts of immoral means. No, I, I don't want anyone to stop me. So I'd rather be an atheist. So these, these psychopaths in power have promoted the liberal, materialistic, progressivist ideology that empowers them. And that's the world we're living in. And so the Islamic world is on the defensive. It has been for a, a century, century or two. But it still has that secret of spiritual solidarity. Right now during Ramadan, all over the world, maybe a billion and a half to two billion people are fasting throughout the entire day, not having even a drop of water from the first light of dawn until sundown, not having a slightest morsel of food from the first drop 
uh, for the first, first uh, light of dawn until sundown. That's a pretty intense practice. And nearly you know, one and a half to two billion people are doing this together. We fast together. We don't just go off into a cave and fast as an individual seeking spiritual enlightenment on an individual basis. No. I mean, yeah, you can do that if you want. But no, everybody fasts because spirituality is the purpose of life. Being a better person is the purpose of life. Allah says that we have created you, you know, as to uh, compete in goodness, uh, to see which of you has the most piety or taqwa. Uh, that's the purpose of life. Uh, so getting, climbing that ladder of piety and taqwa and goodness is the purpose of life for everybody. That's why everybody fasts. Islam says every fast. Quran puts that injunction on everybody. Well, yeah, if you have a physical issue that prevents you from fasting, that's fine. But basically, anybody who doesn't have that kind of serious physical issue has to fast. Likewise, we pray. It's actually mandatory to pray the five times daily prayers, and for, uh, for men at least, it depends on your law school, I guess, to pray the Jumrah prayer on Friday. Everybody prays together. We gather together here in the Jumrah prayer, just like we gather together in the Eid prayers in these large groups and that togetherness, that spiritual solidarity, that community, that spiritual communitarianism, or whatever you want to call it, that togetherness in that shared aspiration to become a better person and to foster each other's spiritual development and knowing that that is the only purpose of life and knowing that that is the only sane basis for society is the whole key to everything, including solving this problem and curing mass formation psychosis, which is in fact just a symptom of a deeply sick and degenerate culture that needs to come back to God. And the simple straight path back to God is the Sirat al-Mustaqim, the straight path of Islam. So if you're lucky enough to be living somewhere where there is a Muslim community and you want to join a, a community that's based on spiritual aspirations, that's based on shared encouragement of each other's spiritual growth, you should go check out that Islamic community near you. You should go down to the masjid, the mosque. You should try uh, five times daily prayer. It's a little, it takes a little practice to learn how to do it. You don't have to formally convert to go to the mosque and participate in the prayer. You could do that a few times first, or as many times as you want, before you finally take the shahada and testify that there is no God but God and Muhammad is his prophet. At that point, you've entered into Islam and you're a part of that spiritual community and you've just given yourself a huge boost in terms of avoiding the problems that lead to mass formation psychosis, the isolation, loneliness, feelings of pointlessness and meaninglessness, the free-floating anxiety and the uh, aggression and frustration. And I mean, I wish I could say that Muslim communities had been so immune to mass formation psychosis that they totally not only refused to participate in the COVID madness and the, you know, the post 9-11 madness and the current uh, Ukraine madness. Unfortunately, it's not entirely true. In the West, a whole lot of Muslims have basically gotten uh, West toxicated, as the Iranians say, or uh, acculturated into the culture of mass formation psychosis, the Western culture of individualism, materialism, and atheism. Uh, they've just kind of absorbed some of that by osmosis, and so they have not stood up as strongly as they need to do to stand against the causes of mass formation psychosis, against the wave of mass formation psychosis that's sweeping over the world, but they should. And I think overall, the Muslims have done a little better, just like that there's a, a book out uh, called uh, Muslims, uh, The Most Civilized But Not Enough, uh, by Dr. Javed Jamil that uses all sorts of statistics and sociology and so on, uh, all sorts of numbers crunching to show that overall Muslims are doing better on the key social indicators. They're less lonely. They're less isolated. They're healthier. They're, uh, they have lower levels of, of suicide and crime and sexual diseases and single parent families and uh, all of these kinds of negative social indicators, alcoholism, of course, much uh, considerably lower in Muslim communities. And the more that the people are practicing Muslims, praying together, praying five times a day, praying together on Fridays, uh, fasting for Ramadan, of course, which almost all nominal Muslims do, uh, the more they're practicing, the more immune they are to these negative social indicators and the more immune they are to mass formation psychosis. So that's the, uh, the takeaway here is 
that the cure for mass formation psychosis is spiritual solidarity. And the most straightforward practice of spiritual solidarity is the one revealed in the Quran. Uh, and that's the, that's the straight path. However, let me also say that if you're Christian uh, or of, of another religion, you too can, of course, participate to some extent in spiritual solidarity. Those Italian immigrants in that town in Pennsylvania that didn't have any heart attacks, they were all Catholics. They all got, went to church. They're practicing spiritual solidarity too. Church-going people are practicing the kind of spiritual solidarity when they celebrate religious holidays in a genuinely religious way, which is unfortunately kind of rare here in the United States. Uh, that's a kind of practice of spiritual solidarity as they remind each other to uh, that God is watching us, uh, that you should be the best you can be as they try, uh, as they try sincerely to imitate their uh, prophet and model, uh, Sayyidina Isa alayhi salam, or Jesus Christ, uh, peace upon him. They're also practicing a kind of spiritual solidarity too. And I think that in these end times, we Muslims need to develop our spiritual solidarity with the Christians, especially if we're living in nominally Christian countries, or I guess post-Christian countries. This should be one of the biggest efforts that we make as Muslims now, is to reach out to the Christian community uh, and give them that message of spiritual solidarity, talk about Islam and spiritual solidarity, and, and urge them to practice it too. And then we can join together because we have so much in common as well. Uh, as the Quran famously says that you will surely find the most intensive people in animosity towards the believers to be the Jews and those who associate others with Allah, that is the, the mushrikeen. You'll find the nearest of them in affection to the believers, those who say we are Christians. Um, so that, that's uh, those who say in uh, in the Nasara, those who say that we are Christians. And so our spiritual solidarity as Muslims, I believe, should extend to the true Christians. And, you know, different scholars like Sheikh Imran Hussein have different ideas about who the true Christians really are in this time. But I think there are probably some of them everywhere. It's not just the, those in the Eastern Orthodox tradition, but probably people in all sorts of these different Christian schools that have all broken up and gone in all these different directions. You know, they need spiritual solidarity too. The whole Christian world does too. And maybe Islam can actually help. Uh, and maybe when the Christians recognize the truth of the Quranic message, even if they continue to follow Sayyidina Isa or Jesus as their main prophet, maybe that will be the moment that they can come back together in spiritual solidarity, inshallah. I don't know. But we humans, we're here for that, for that spiritual solidarity, which is, again, the cure for mass formation psychosis. So um, Allah, please uh, help us to enhance and preserve our spiritual solidarity. Allah, please save us from all these ills of the modern secular atheist world, these ills of loneliness and isolation and pointlessness and meaninglessness and anxiety and frustration and aggression. Ya Allah, please bless us with uh, the togetherness that we need to ward these off. Ya Allah, please uh, help us to spread your message of spiritual solidarity uh, and, and to intensify the faith and practice of our fellow Muslims and to reach out with the truth about Islam to those who are not yet uh, walking the straight path of Islam. Ya Allah, uh, please bring our Muslim people together and bless and protect us and bring us back together as one healthy body. Mm -hmm.